Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a program that provides scriptural insight and answers to the many questions you have about life's issues from a biblical perspective. The Word of God is present to enrich your life, so why not consider God's principles for everyday living? Well, we've asked for the help of some local ministers who have carefully considered the questions that you, the viewers, have sent us. And they are prepared to give us some really good answers. But first, I'd like to introduce them to you. We have with us today, Pastor Janet Wind of the Cornerstone Church in Lima, followed by Pastor Shelley Head, interim minister who travels, but is located near Worcester, Ohio. Next, we have Pastor Patrick Kamler, of Westminster Christian Church, and by the way, we should also mention the familiar face there, is also a producer and anchor of our sports report here at Channel 44. And last, of course, we have Pastor Brad Taylor of the Lima Community Church. Welcome all of you to the program Thank today. You. Happy Thank to you. have you. I think I'd like to start by asking a question uh, that we've never gotten in before, but this question deals with the matter of profanity. And um, it, it talks about the use of profanity, even among Christians. It talks about the fact that, you know, we are what we say sometimes, you know, and that we have the power. Our words have power mm -hmm. coming out of our mouths. What do you have to say about, do, do you see, do you hear profanity among churchgoers? What, and if so, what do you think about that? And, I, and I'm not trying to put you in a position of judging. I'm trying to put us in a position of saying we have to be accountable nonetheless for the things we say. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I think in Luke chapter six, um, Jesus talked about out mm -hmm. of the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we think of it that way, rather than a rule to follow, I think when it's about a rule to follow, it just doesn't make sense. Like, well, why not? But when we begin to question about what comes out of our mouth is what we're putting into our hearts. And so what does that profanity, what, what, is it, what does it mean? What's it attached to? Mm -hmm. How is it affecting my heart? And um, that's, that's where I begin to go, hmm, maybe this is something that needs to be taken a little more seriously. Very good, very good. Everybody else? And I think the, you know, the closer that you draw to God in your relationship, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts mm. us. The Holy yeah. Spirit is the one that is the teacher, the leader, the guide. He mm -hmm. leads us into all truth. And um, rather than giving people lists of rules and regulations, as you said, Shelley, to follow, to teach them to develop that relationship with God, and He will mm. lead them and lead them into um, just that fully sanctified life. And mm. the, the more that you develop that relationship with God and fall in love with Him, the more you want to honor Him and you want to bless Him and please Him. And, mm. and those things just take care of themselves. Yeah, I think it does come down to the whole idea of kind of what is underpinning that. You mentioned out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is kind of pinning the language? Why are you, why are you saying the, the things that you're saying? You know? and, and you can also go into profanity as there's a lot of you know, cultural constructs there. There's a lot of societal constructs mm -hmm. there because there are words that you know, parents bring up their kids and say, well, that's a swear word. You know, I mm -hmm. remember getting grief from my friends because I would say, holy cow. I'm a Cubs fan. <laughs> I was raised saying, holy cow. And I would have someone come, you can't say that. That's profanity. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's right. not. I was raised by a sailor. I know what profanity is. <laughs> right? So it all comes down to kind of what are we meaning when we say things like mm -hmm. that. And I think there are times where we can't get too legalistic. We can't get hung up on the words. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. now, if you're saying I had a I had a lived to a, next to a guy in college who had one particular word that he would that he would lean on because I don't know if he didn't know any other words or what the case was. <laughs> there was there's something there. Like when you are swearing that much every other word that there's something with the heart there's mm -hmm. something that's kind of mm -hmm. underpinning that um when it when it slips out when it's an occasional thing like should you say it you know should brad be swearing from the pulpit no <laughs> should any of us know but i think it's one of those where we can get a little bit too legalistic and we can end up even kind of pushing people away from yeah. the faith if we mm -hmm. get too far with it yeah. yeah i think i think um probably something all of us have experienced in ministry is being around people who speak a certain way hmm. and, and who uh, adapt a little bit based on the fact that a pastor's nearby. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I play racquetball with some guys in the mornings and occasionally racquetball you know, is an intense sport and um, a, a 
a word might fly a time or two, you know, in frustration or, or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times those guys will, will apologize to me, mm-hmm. um, which it, it doesn't necessarily offend me. But right. I think one of the things that I recognize in that is that as Christians, we ought not hold people who don't share our morals to the same moral standard. Mm. Um, and so, yeah. uh, you know, mm-hmm. I think we've, we've discussed, uh, you know, even in, in prep a little bit about how um, I would hope that people would be comfortable being around me, being around us as pastors, as Christians, um, being themselves, understanding that we love them, we care about them. And that, as Janet said, um, as a person grows closer to God and they develop in their relationship with God, um, the spirit is going to tweak some things about us and, and is going to change some of our habits. And one of those habits might be the way we talk. You know, mm-hmm. um, Shelley shared a, a scripture from Luke. And, and for me, one of the ones that I think immediately of is Ephesians 4. Let no unwholesome mm-hmm. talk come out of your mouth, mm-hmm. but only, you know, what is uplifting. And um, there's a lot there's a lot in Paul, you know, that, that touches on that. But yeah. And I think, too, you know, people are wanting to feel loved and accepted and like Mm -hmm. they belong. And when we accept people for who they are and where they are and love them to a better place, that's the Christ (laughs) that draws them to Mm -hmm. himself Mm -hmm. and um, not expecting them, Mm -hmm. as as you said, to live up to some uh, moral standard, but to be able to just love them where they are, just like Christ loved us where we were while yeah. we were yet oh, sinners yeah. and he right. loved us mm-hmm. and drew us to a better place that we would love them whether they're Christian or not Christian, you know, sure, and just sure. loving them where they're at, yeah. love people where they're at That's and good. let God be the Holy Spirit. Not, not, uh, yeah. <laughs> we can't be, keep trying to be the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Let the Holy yeah. Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And I think so. there's something to be said too, that if you are easily offended or if, if mm-hmm. someone kind of lets that go and you're really offended by it, it's causing you problems, you know, maybe it's you that needs the heart check Absolutely. a little bit. Maybe it's you <laughs> needs to look Absolutely. inside yourself and going, okay, why is this person's <clears throat> language coarse mm-hmm. though it may be? Why is it giving me so many problems? There's something that I need to look at in myself. There's, is there work that God needs to do in my heart? And I would say there probably is a little bit of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we were talking earlier when we were preparing about the idea of that, um, at least where I was raised in the Bible Belt, not raised, but raised in the church. Um, it, it was like, if you don't drink, you don't cuss, you don't smoke, you, you, you've met all the requirements to be a Christian. Right. <laughs> so yeah. it's about outward, outward appearance. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes that, that, that legalism mm-hmm. goes deep and we have to, I, I like what you said, kind of address, well, what's wrong with my heart mm-hmm. if I'm offended by that. Mm-hmm. So that's good, Very I like good. that. I think there's a, there's a pattern too that we ought to recognize that um, if a person does begin a relationship with Jesus or, or you know, starts exploring that, it takes time for character mm, to change. Absolutely. And yeah. so, um, you know, we've all seen examples of a person's character changing quickly as a result of God's grace, mm-hmm. but that we shouldn't set that up as the norm. It does take time. And so yeah. if there's a person that is a person of faith who may have had a lifestyle where they used a certain kind of language, give them grace, you know, yeah. allow them to, recognize and again let the holy spirit do what the holy spirit's going to do i'm sorry we don't know people's story we don't know where they Mm. have come from i I was sharing earlier and just that story of a dear friend of mine who um, is just powerfully used of god in ministry today but when she first came to our church she came into a service literally had come from a bar she Mm. she was drunk she'd been drinking all night came in swearing came in seeking and desperately looking for God because she knew um, her life was falling apart, mm-hmm. her marriage was falling apart, and she, she knew she desperately needed answers. Mm-hmm. And if the church people had, had looked at her badly or spoke to her badly or turned her away or didn't accept her, I hate to think where she might be today, but because she was accepted, because people loved her where she was at, she is used so powerfully by God today to to change and to impact people's lives. And and God doesn't clean the fish up and then bring them to us. You know, we have to we have to take people where they're at and love them where they're at. I was just about to to mention that same uh, example Mm. you mentioned. 
God called us to catch the fish, not to clean yes. the fish. <laughs> and we sometimes yeah. get that mixed up. Right. Very true. Yeah. Well, listen, we've got other things I want to discuss, but we need to pause for a break. And we're going to come right back, and we've got some more great discussion, so don't touch that remote. Okay. <laughs> Be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we're glad you stayed with us. Another question that we got in from viewers was about worrying. Mm -hmm. Just plain worry. One uh, mom who is um, taking care of little children right now, her little children, and she barely has time to read the, the Bible. She's so busy and she's, she's got feelings of guilt about that. She's just worried about it. And, and, and there are other kinds of examples as well. How do we overcome worry? And I know the Bible speaks to worry. It does, but we need to hear it over, over and over again. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about worry? You know, Don't that, do it, huh? To that young mom who has those toddlers at home, just, just from a pastoral perspective, um, I just want to say to her what, what a college professor said to me once, which was, uh, do as you can. Yeah. You know, God gives us so much grace, and, and yeah. God recognizes the importance of her being a mother, Absolutely. and that there are seasons in life where um, our, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. Now, our relationship with Jesus ought to always be the highest priority in our life. But um, a part of that is just recognizing what you're called to do and, and understanding that those toddlers, they, they don't have any other means of living except by their mom and their dad, you know? And so I just, just want to try to release that person from that guilt and understand that God is, is there with her and, and yeah. desires that relationship, you know? Absolutely. I want to jump on what you just said, God is there with her, because yeah. that's something I feel like a lot of people who struggle with worry are not practicing the presence of God in their right. life. Mm -hmm. And that's a discipline, mm -hmm. yes, because the Holy Spirit promises He's going to be with us always, right? Mm -hmm. That comforter, that friend, but it requires us being connected. Absolutely. It requires that, that being connected to the life source. And that's hard when you have screaming toddlers around your ankles. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know, I've been there. Um, but, but that idea of knowing that God is with me Absolutely. day in, day out, and sometimes it's just take a breath, God is with me, recognize him, sm small prayers, you know, mm -hmm. Lord be with me right now in my frustration. And, and watch how he begins to move and change and change the, the whole outcome because of the change that's happening in me, yeah. you know? It's like that continual abiding. I know, yeah. that, you know, Isaiah 26, three says, you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on yeah. you. So yeah. if we keep, as you said, keep your mind on him just in that relationship. And I know even all of us can get busy days, lives, whatever, whether you have toddlers running around or not, and you can still take advantage of just talking with God just throughout your day while you're changing diapers, while you're doing yeah. dishes, while you're doing laundry, while you're driving in the car, in the shower. It can be just that continual relationship and you know, special times are wonderful, but take the times that you can find and the times yeah. that you can get and God will honor that and meet you and in that place. That. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. That, that mom with the toddlers, the kids are gonna see that. Absolutely. You know, that's a good point too about the, the kids kind of seeing mm -hmm. the, par the parent, the mom, whatever. It's it, part of it is is having that time and building that time in, but I think the more powerful example is that mom or whoever, any any parent, being able to demonstrate this is enough of a part of a priority where you know maybe if I can't dedicate ten minutes to study or maybe I can't escape into my prayer closet for five minutes and do something, but it's so important to me that I will, you know, I will listen to scripture on my phone, I will listen to a podcast of a, yeah. of a pastor that I know or something that I'm, that I'm plugged into, you know, that I'll just, I'll, I'll find that time. And as the kid grows up, they'll see, oh, this is, this is important. This is something that is made set. a priority. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's not just a, a thing I do in the morning and then, okay, that's my Jesus time. And then I get to act however, yeah, you know, right. I want. That's right, that's good. Um, yeah. Another part of that is, and I've preached on worry different times. I've talked about it numerous times. And one of the best things I ever saw, 
about worry and about anxiety because so many people seem to be struggling with it. I saw on, on, a, on a Facebook or on a post on Reddit, actually, anxiety, moments of anxiety are conspiracy theories you tell about yourself. Hmm. Because when we get into anxiety, what's the worst case scenario of anything that we're thinking of? At least for me, when I worry about things, when I have anxiety, like I go to the immediate worst case scenario of whatever it is that could happen. Mm -hmm. You almost have to like gag me and tie me up to get me on an airplane <laughs> because I've already considered all the terrible things that could happen. And the truth is that stuff very seldom happens in terms of like mathematically speaking, it just doesn't happen that often, but we get so worked up over all the things that could possibly happen to us in our lives. And we stray away from the Holy Spirit. We stray away from, from God and that relationship in our lives. And we let all this other stuff kind of come in. And if we maintain that relationship with God, we maintain that closeness, however we do it, I think it, it lessens the impact and the influence that worry and anxiety have in our lives. Absolutely. You know, when your mind is stayed on Him, you're thinking about the bigness of God. When we're mm -hmm. worried, it's these other things become these mountains and become these, right. yes, they become yeah. so much bigger than our God is because we're focused on those rather than on God. Yeah. And, and that's such a key, like you said, meditating yeah. on Him, making sure that you, it's just that continual fellowship, that continual, and yeah. keeps you there. I was thinking too, uh, when you were saying that about, um, anxiety and worry how prevalent it is that was prevalent in me from the time I was a child mm -hmm. th that constant mm -hmm. you know that angst or whatever and I remember early in my relationship with the Lord I had an evangelist friend said Shelley you've got to learn to enjoy the journey yes and that has been a little phrase I've carried through my whole mm -hmm. <laughs> walk with the Lord enjoy the journey yeah. because the truth is from here to that walk into eternity, it's a journey. Absolutely. And I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what's going to happen on my drive home today. But I have come to a place of confidence in Christ yeah. that I know He's with me, He's surrounding me, mm -hmm. He's for me. And so why should I not enjoy the journey? Mm -hmm. Why should I not enjoy the colors of the leaves on my drive home yeah, or, absolutely. you know, the phone call from my son or whatever, and not worrying about what's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that that took some tremendous rewiring for me, literally, like like learning how to rethink patterns in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it comes from what you're just saying, that practicing His presence, Absolutely. it's so good. So Shelly, I, I, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the, the term rewiring. You know, I'm, I'm, first of all, like this, this conversation is just helpful for mm. me because mm. I'm, I could have written the question, right? I'm, <laughs> my, my tendency is to you have. You did, I think. We yeah, actually, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. exactly you you know? Know? Yeah. Um, but it's just the reminder that, you know, Jesus says, who of you can add a second to your yeah, life, absolutely. you know? Um, but this idea of, of rewiring, I'm, I'm privileged to be married to a godly counselor mm -hmm. and um, yeah. just, she's very, very gifted and, um, just some of the reading she's done and some of the things she understands from a, a, a Christian perspective, but also from the psychology perspective. Yeah. So your wife lays you on her couch? Yeah, yeah. She, she has her hands full with my diagnosis, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the reality is science is showing us that we can rewire our brains. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, neur mm -hmm. yes. uh, neuroscience mm -hmm. is is teaching us a lot about this. And, and what's hilarious is that, um, you know, Carrie helps me understand kind of that, that psychology may think this is a new thing, but the reality is scripture says God is making all things new. Yes. And this is what Revelation says, yeah. right? This yes. is who he is. And, and that includes our minds. We, yes. we can re, um, reframe the way we think and, and create new neural pathways that actually help us deal with our anxiety and worry. And that is a wonder of science and as people who follow Jesus, it happens to be something that we believe God created in us. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? I think of Romans 12, too, to yeah. be transformed yeah. by the renewing yes. of your mind. Yeah, exactly. Paul knew it way back then. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Nothing Paul new under the sun, then. right? Yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. good. So excellent. Good. This is very excellent. I, I certainly hope the viewers are, are, are learning a lot from this. Another question has nothing to do with what we've just been discussing, uh, but it deals with the difference between discipleship and evangelism. And I think what we ought to do is define each of those and, and then go into the importance that they play, the important roles they play in the church. Uh, let's take evangelism first. Let's, who wants to give us just a, a little summary of what evangelism is? 
You want us to step out? <laughs> well, it's, I think evangelism is, <laughs> is our, uh, our effort to uh, introduce other people to Jesus, to yeah. help people come to a saving knowledge yeah. of who Jesus is and what mm -hmm. God has done for them. Whatever form that takes. It yeah. can be right, behind right. a pulpit, mm -hmm. it can be at the water cooler yeah. or yeah. somewhere. Hopefully, hopefully lifestyle Share evangelism, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 And then when we get to discipleship, that's after the person has been converted to Christ. It kind of goes back to what you were saying about loving people in their journey. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a brand new baby Christian who's never been in church or never had that rearing of the home. There's gonna be some things that take time to learn. Yeah. Obviously the Bible, if they've not been sure. raised in the church, they're not even That's gonna know right. the Bible. So I think taking that person by the hand and walking with them, crying with them, praying with them, um, you know, just believing in them. Yeah. And I, knowing that they're gonna fall, they're gonna make a boo-boo yep. like any baby They're gonna mess up, <laughs> right. just like I mess up. You just, know? Right. Yeah. Here. right? Yeah. But growing to become mature, that's what the Bible yes. talks about, that yeah. we are to become mature yeah. in Christ. And that's a journey, just like it is mm -hmm. when you have a baby and they have to grow through all of those stages. Yeah. And it's the same with your spiritual life. But yeah. growing, God doesn't want us all to stay babies when we accept Christ, but wants us to grow from that point and become fully mature and yeah. able to... Uh, live that full I abundant life. I was thinking life. earlier when we were talking about, uh, I can't remember what we were talking about, but earlier I was thinking about two women when I was saved. I was 20, maybe almost 21 when I got saved, living out in Oklahoma by myself. I didn't know anybody. And Opal and Ruth, <laughs> believe it or not, yeah. two elderly women in the church that just loved on me. Mm. In spite of the way I dressed, mm. in spite of the fact that they knew I smoked, in spite mm -hmm. of the fact that my life was a mess. Wow. They took me in their homes and they loved on me. They would give me a scripture that would encourage me. And I think back of, of those ladies now and think, where would I be today mm -hmm. had it not been for them? Right. You know? Yeah. I think anybody, whether they're saved or not, they want to be accepted Absolutely. for who they are. Yeah. You know? yeah. I look at how Christ drew the woman that was caught in the midst of adultery. Mm -hmm. The real ministry started after everybody else left the scene. It was just oh, him and yeah, her, yeah. you know? And that's where he could really show her that he accepted her. And it, but, but here's the thing, his acceptance of her was not tantamount to accepting what she had done. Because he told her to you know, go in peace, don't sin anymore, don't, don't do that again. But he accepted her. And isn't it a wonderful feeling to be accepted though? Can you speak Absolutely. to that? How wonderful that is to be accepted for who you are. And I'd say that's a part of evangelism too, though. Yeah, yeah, I would say so you too. Know? Yeah. And I think there is an element of that because you have people who, you have someone who maybe has spent, you know, 15 minutes in a church and they may have a greater understanding of who Christ is than someone who has sat in the pews for 40 years mm -hmm. just because of they have wanted to get to know really who Jesus is more than maybe just thinking, okay, well, I, I come to church every week and, mm -hmm. and, I, and I bring a Bible. I never actually open the thing, <laughs> but I bring it with me and, and I don't smoke and I don't chew and I do all this other kind of stuff that apparently is, is you know, how to get into heaven. So <laughs> I've done all the stuff that I need to do, but they don't really know Jesus. So I, I look at it and I see there are times where I think evangelism and discipleship can blur in certain places yes. oh, yeah. because you have people who don't know the scripture. And it's not just about head knowledge. It's not just about memorizing scripture, but I think there's an element of you can, I, I had a former pastor who liked to say, going into church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going into McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. Right. Yeah. You know, he, would, he would say that quite a bit. And I think that there is more of actually knowing and learning about who Jesus is and knowing him mm. that counts for more than just, okay, well, I'm, I'm here, you know, what else do you got? I'm here in church, so what, what else do you got? So I think there are times where you can evangelize those who, you know, are, are needing discipleship and that discipleship can take a version of evangelism, just kind of helping other people understand and maybe even get started on their, on their walk of faith. Mm -hmm. That's I also look at how, um, how the Lord dealt with Peter after Peter had um, denied him three times. And then upon Christ's resurrection, he meets Peter and the other boys <laughs> down by the seashore. Mm -hmm. And he calls Peter to feed his lambs. I mean, he, 
he reinstates yes. him, he revalidates so him good. right in front of his peers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Isn't that beautiful mm -hmm. love? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, I, and I've seen that juxtaposed to situations where somebody has done something sinful in the church and they bring them to stand before the whole church body, oh. thinking that that's going to yeah. resolve the matter. I, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I, I, I've seen that. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I, I've never seen that. I've heard it, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I always wonder if they kind of get to that part in scripture where it's like, you know, take them aside and warn them first and then take them to the church elders. And then yeah. if yeah. that process, doesn't work, then, yeah. then bring them before the, yeah. the mm -hmm. entire yeah. church. And just not, mm -hmm. again, you have to kind of look at the situations, the cultures which it was written and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's like, I don't know that bringing me out before the entire church and shaming me has ever worked for anything. Not that it's ever happened, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know that that would ever actually work for what we would actually be trying to do. Might embitter you. Right, exactly. So I just, yeah, yeah there, are, there are things that you have to apply. There's scriptural knowledge has to be applied with love. Because mm. if you just go by, okay, well, it says here that I'm supposed to shame you in front of the entire congregation now. <laughs> That's step three of the process. And God's <laughs> redemptive, you, you know. He's not yeah. punitive. He's redemptive. Mm. He's right. always looking to yeah. restore. And, and there's about that much difference between the two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we've, we've only got, uh, I think, about uh, a minute left in, in this show. I, I guess it, we, it, we dare not go into another topic, but I want to thank you all for the contribution that you've made mm -hmm. and, uh, because I believe that somebody's being ministered to today, somebody's being helped. And remember, uh, you're going to be back again next week on the show, and we want to say this to our viewing audience, so you want to tune in next week to just listen to the words of wisdom as we just squeeze them out of these folks, okay? <laughs> Thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week here on Life Questions. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.